All right, welcome back. Jim Rickards is the author of The Death of Money, The Coming Collapse of the International Monetary System, and editor of the newsletter Superintelligence. And Kevin Freeman is the founder of the National Security Investment Consultant Institute and author of Game Plan, How to Protect Yourself from the Coming Cyber Economic Attack. Wow, this is going to be a, I'm a little, I'm terrified already. Uh, so we'll start there. Uh, now, you watch the news, and it's seemingly, you know, it seems like everything's going to be okay. We're, we're recovering. It's been a slow recovery, but uh, we're on the right path. Is that the right analysis, or are they not looking deep enough? Yeah, I think they're not looking deep enough, Stu. Uh, look, we have been in a technical recovery since 2009. The economy has been growing, but we're actually in a depression, the way Maynard Keynes defined it. And when you hear the word depression, people think about declining GDP and soup lines and all that. But right. his definition of a depression was you can have growth, but it's below potential. In other words, if the potential for U.S. growth is, say, 3 3.5%, which it is, and short-term potential is more like 5 which it is, and you're actually growing about 2 the difference between the three and the two, that's depressed growth. It doesn't sound like a lot, but over 30 years, that could one economy would be double the size of the other. So we, we have growth, but it's depressed growth. Um, you know, the unemployment rate has gone down. People know about that. But we're substituting part-time jobs for full-time jobs. We're losing the $50,000 jobs, getting the $10,000 jobs. Labor force participation is low. So there's a lot of weakness in this economy. But we're told uh, that, you know, we have this wonderful situation going on with oil and and look I, I gotta tell you I go to the pump and I uh, you know I fill that thing up for thirty dollars instead of seventy and it feels kind of nice um, is now oil I think does give us a short-term gain here in the United States but give me a bigger picture Kevin. well we are the world's largest oil producer now uh, approximately and we've seen our economy recover on the back of the oil producing states if you take oil uh, at current prices or lower prices, it's going to decimate our shale industry. And it's going to wipe out that those $50,000 jobs that were produced in the past few years were in the oil patch. And so it's a two-edged sword. There's no doubt about it. If I could strike a deal today and say we have $50 a barrel oil for the next 25 years, I'd probably strike that deal. Right. Yeah, that's how I think about the, the American people feel. Because, I mean, you know, I, going back, you know, maybe talking politically s several years ago, maybe to the 2008 election, we've got, high, high, you know, high gas prices and people are stressed out about energy. That was one of the biggest things in that entire election. And, you know, conservatives largely made the argument, hey, increase supply. Use things like fracking. Use increased drilling. Let's increase the supply, and these prices will go down. Now, at the time, the media said the exact opposite. It won't help. Speculators are the ones to blame. You know all these arguments. Right. Um, so we did increase supply, and it seems to have worked. These are the things that I was hoping would come to fruition in a few years. Here we are now sitting in a, in a situation where oil has gone down, and it seems to have worked. And, and yet you're hearing it, it's, it, I'm not sure to, it, it's, I think most people feel a little uneasy about it, maybe because it just happened so quickly. Well, here's the problem, too, and Kevin's exactly right about the impact of this. I like $2 gasoline as well as the next guy. So yeah. when oil goes from $4 or $2, I pull up at the pump. I love that. <laughs> but here's the problem. Where did all this oil come from? There's $5.4 trillion of investment, stocks and bonds, that were issued for the fracking and the exploration and the development. Those securities were issued with the assumption that oil would be somewhere between 80 and 130 dollars a barrel. You know, pick your spot, mm -hmm. different projects. With with oil at 50 or even lower, maybe at 40, a large percentage of that debt's going to have to be written off. So you're going to have trillions of dollars of write-offs, which is bigger than the subprime crisis in 2007. Now, who owns those bonds? Look inside your 401k. So we, I like cheap gas at the pump, but inside your 401k, you might have some bond fund that your broker sold you. Not everybody, but some people. Look inside, and what kind of bonds are in there? Look inside. You might find mm -hmm. that you have a lot of this junk debt in there. And this is not just a, a US problem, as Kevin described. This is a global problem. Emerging markets have nine trillion dollars worth of debt, dollar denominated debt, issued, uh, and with the strong dollar, they may not be able to pay that back either. So you're looking at uh, more than $10 trillion of debt, and a large percentage of that is going to be written off. This is a tsunami of bad debt. So I like the cheap gas, but watch out for the write-offs. And that's, that's frightening. And these numbers don't even seem like numbers. Like I, it, no. it's, it's almost as if we're just making up numbers at this point. I, I'm expecting to see bajillion on a report at any point. Mm. I mean, we, those numbers we were talking about in the, in the monologue, you know, hundreds of trillions of dollars. Can you, can you give 
uh, you know, because Glenn is the type of guy who will sit there and he'll watch Bloomberg for hours and understand what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm not. I don't think the American people are, right. to be honest. When you're talking about derivatives and $200 trillion, explain how we get there, what these things actually are. And, you know, uh, if you can, boil it down to, I don't know, second or third grade level. Sure. Well, that, that's a really good question. Uh, let's just take subprime, because we all know what happened in 2008. You know, people's 401ks got, they lost half of them. Mm -hmm. Their housing values declined. So, so we all know what happened. What, what started that? There was $1 trillion of subprime in what's called Altair, which is sort of like subprime. So there was one, $1 trillion of bad mortgages at the beginning of that crisis. And a lot of people said, you know, historically, write-offs were about 5%. Let's assume they're 20%, which is really high. 20% hmm. of a trillion is $200 billion, which was actually not much bigger than the SNL crisis. So everyone said, well, we'll get through it. Right. What they missed was that on top of the trillion dollars of mortgages, there were $6 trillion of derivatives. These are just contracts. You, know, you and I make bets, basically. These are mm -hmm. bets where there's no mortgage, there's no house. We're just betting on the mortgage market. You pile that on top of the debt, and then the debt gets written off, but one of us lost that bet. So you actually had 20% write-offs not on a trillion dollars of mortgages, but on $6 trillion of derivatives. So the actual losses were over a trillion. Now, the point is today, with the oil patch mm -hmm. debt, the emerging markets debt, that's 10 times bigger than subprime was. So, you know, whether it's a trillion or a gazillion, just think of it as 10 times bigger than what we had in 2007. That's wow. out there. It doesn't mean it collapses tomorrow. I'm not saying that. It could take a year, year and a half to play out. Good, good analogy there is uh, the 1998 collapse. Remember, Russia defaulted mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. and the long-term capital management crisis. I was actually involved with that. That took a year and a half to play out. It started in Thailand in uh, June of 97. And it came to complete, near complete collapse in September of 1998. So sometimes these things take a year to play out. I mean, that was but, at least sixth or seventh grade level. I just want to make that clear. It was well above second or third. Well, what we're seeing in Russia today mm -hmm. with the ruble collapse is very reminiscent of what we saw in the late 1990s. And of course, the market, stock market did dip and then it came on and, and, and went strong. And, and peaked, but it was an incredible peak with internet bubble and all of the other sure. things. It created a financial bubble. So you've got, you can pay me now, or you can enjoy a quick bubble and pay me much more later, and we seem to be enjoying the quick bubble. Well, can you look back in history to all the collapses in the United States? I mean, is there something in common that can be learned, and are we walking to another one of those? Because people look at it, they say, stock market's at 18,000. I mean, uh, what are you guys so worried about? All bear markets begin with a market peak. And so <laughs> yes, in 1929, it was a very good year until you got to October. Mm. And, and so y you can't just say the market is going up now, therefore there are no problems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it does seem like the way it's treated in the media, though. Well, I, well, I, I agree with Kevin, but I have a slightly different analysis. Each crisis gets bigger than the one before, and the bailout gets bigger than, than the one before. So let's just take the last two big ones, 1998, and 2008, they were the last two times the global markets came right up to the edge of complete collapse. In 98, Wall Street got together and bailed out a hedge fund. Mm -hmm. In 2008, the central banks got together and bailed out Wall Street. The next crisis, maybe 2018, Who the central who's going to bail out the central banks? <laughs> There's only one clean balance sheet left in the world, the International Monetary Fund. So what you're looking at there is world money and a world bailout. So the dollar will no longer be the leading reserve currency, because the only the only way you can issue more money to bail out the central banks is from the IMF. How on earth can we be talking about this? I, I, I don't understand how we could get here after going through what we went through in 2008. We all seemingly were on the same page that what went what happened last time was not a good idea to repeat. And you know, you are discussing it, basically we just seem to be doubling down at roulette. Correct. And eventually the wrong number comes up. Correct. In, in 2008, at the time of the last crisis, the Fed balance sheet was $800 billion. Today it's about $4 trillion, so, so five times bigger. Okay. So, but they never took that back. Everyone says it's all good, but they never took the money back. What happens if there's a crisis tomorrow? I just explained. We were talking about how it could be coming soon. What are they going to do? Go to $8 trillion, $12 trillion? Where's the outer limit of confidence? When do they destroy confidence in the dollar? And if they can't print more money... The only place you're going to get liquidity 
is from the IMF. I use the expression world money. Mm -hmm. That's how I think about it. The, the technical name is special drawing right, SDR. They come up with these names, by the way, so no one understands it. <laughs> of course. It's like yeah. Federal Reserve is yeah. the central bank of the United States. They mm -hmm. just don't want to call it the central bank. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is world money, and that's the only place it's going to come up. And the only other thing they can do is just lock everything down and say, okay, you can't get your money. Well, reprogram the ATMs. Maybe you'll get $300 a day for gas and groceries, but we're not going to actually let you get your money. That's like a bail-in, like they did in Cyprus. Right. It's, it's, it, this percentage above this amount, that's not yours anymore. Right. And they've recently ruled that the money that you deposit in a bank is not your money. It's a loan that you have made to the bank. You don't own the <laughs> money. You've <laughs> loaned the bank money. I feel like I, you're, you're telling me I put money in a bank, and yes. they can at any I mean, I guess they can at any time tell me I can't take it out. Uh, they, there are restrictions on that, but that's not America, is it? It's the world. Kevin's exactly right. The, the, by the way, you know, we say these things, and it sounds like, oh, gee, you guys are stretching to come up with scary scenarios. It's not true. It's all documented. You can go to the IMF website. Mm -hmm. You can go to the G20. They issue these communiques, and they have a... I'm enough of a geek that I actually read all these things. <laughs> it, it's all there in black and white, so Kevin's exactly right. Okay. Well, now that's just scaring me, and I don't like it. Um, how about this? Let's take it from this level, where we're scaring... You've already scared me enough, but... Let's go to the next level of what are the geopolitical ramifications of all of this? Because in some ways, this is actually the scarier side of it. Uh, we'll back, be back with that in just a minute. Ten earthquakes jarred the Dallas Metroplex in a span of just 26 hours. What's causing the increase in seismic activity? The media has a culprit, fracking. I feel like all the fracking going on, it's something is causing all these earthquakes. We've never had this type of problem before. But the science is far from settled. Glenn Beck begins to uncover the truth tomorrow. Find out where it leads, only on The Blaze. Talking to Jim Rickards and Kevin Freeman, I said, okay, if I call you guys money geeks, is that, are you, are you comfortable with that? It's fine with me, yeah. Okay. Um, these guys are here because, I mean, they've got a lot more money than me because you guys are able to see how A affects B and how B affects C and how C affects D. You're able to see this big picture that I think is difficult for most people to kind of wrap their arms around. Um, and when we're talking about economies, we're talking about global commodities, we're talking about things that, are, that affect our daily lives but also are the things that make the world go round. And as you see, uh, Saudi Arabia decides not to uh, cut production. This is kind of where this seemed to have all started. They decide not to cut production in oil, and so the oil price uh, starts to tank, and it goes down and down and down. Now, there's a lot of speculation, um, and maybe you can help me out with a little speculation of your own. The idea is either that Saudi Arabia is trying to punish uh, Russia and Iran, or the other speculation is, and maybe there's a combination, that they're trying to shut down the frackers here. They're trying to sh shut down the shale revolution that's gone on here and made us one of the biggest oil producers. Is it one of those two things, a combination or something different? How about all three? Oh. Because they're, they're attacking Iran because of their nuclear program. They're attacking Russia because of their support for the Assad regime in Syria. The Saudis hate, mm -hmm. this, hate uh, Assad because he's a, a Ba'athist. They want a, a Sunni regime in there. And they want to shut down the fracking. So th this is a three for for them, just by kind of lowering the price of oil. Now, what's interesting is you say, well, what's the sweet spot? Because if you lower it too much, they'll hurt themselves in terms of their budget. But if you don't lower it enough, the frackers can still breathe. So where's the point where the frackers get hurt, but the Saudis don't? That's around $60 a barrel. I know it's lower than that now. Mm -hmm. It's down in the high 40s. But mm -hmm. I think the central tendency is going to be between 50 and 60, because that's the place where the fracking gets shut down, but the Saudis don't get hurt too badly. So, you know, kind of watch that. Uh, we may be closer to the bottom at this point, but a lot of the damage is done in ter well, terms of the debt we were talking about earlier. Sure. Now, Kevin, you don't have to take your shirt off and ride a horse like Vladimir Putin, <laughs> but be Vladimir Putin for a second. You see Saudi Arabia, Arabia playing major global games with your economy. How do you react to that? Well, first, you assume that Saudi Arabia is doing this in concert with the United States because Vladimir Putin is going to remember this was the game plan that broke the Soviet Union. Mm. This was economic warfare we did back in the 1980s that really collapsed the Soviet Union. It takes away your hard currency. You also combine that with the fact that we're in an all-out economic war. That's what sanctions are. They're me mechanisms of economic warfare mm. to force Putin's hand. And at the same time, you've been working 
to replace the U.S. dollar as a global as the reserve currency of the world. You're working with China, and you're you're hoping that someday the dollar is no longer the reserve currency of the world. When you see all this happen, and you see the dollar strengthen as a result, your assumption is is it's all out economic war. And what do you do? Well, you could do a cyber attack. Hmm. You could make it known that you're not a failed state, that you still have power. I mean, if if North Korea, whether they did or whether they didn't, if they attacked Sony Pictures, uh, what could Russia do? They could take out the stock exchange. They could do an EMP that would wipe out our electric grid. They're capable. They remind us regularly, we have more nuclear weapons than you do. We have a lot of military capability that you don't have. So what do you do? You look at this and you say, this is an economic war, uh, and, and I need to respond. And the question is, when and how would they respond? This is the world you live in all the time. I mean, these are the sorts of things you're always wargaming. And, and it seems to me that when you get into, these are high-level games we're talking about. And when you get to this level, you, I, I'm always thinking about what China can do. Because China is part of this picture as well. Obviously, we owe them, I think, pretty much every di dollar that we will make for the next thousand years should be sent to China. So at some point, did they jump into this as well? And, and what's their position? Well, you know, in 2009, I actually helped uh, uh, produce and participate in a f uh, financial war game that mm. was sponsored by the Pentagon. It was the first financial war game they had ever done. They've done many war games over the decades. But this one, you, had, you could have no kinetic weapons, nothing that would shoot or explode, no submarines or drones. The only weapons were stocks, bonds, currencies, and derivatives. We had the teams you would expect. We had a Russia team, a China team, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We did this at a top secret weapons laboratory near uh, Washington. And the scenario we did there has actually been playing out in the real world. We said, what if Russia and China got together, put their gold in a depository, issued a new currency backed by the gold, and said to the world, here's the, here's the, the catch. From now on, if you want Russian energy or Chinese manufactured goods, you have to pay us in this new currency. And if you want some of the currency, you can trade with us, or you can put gold, and we'll give you some from our new bank. Now, we knew, that was forward-leaning. We didn't think that was going to happen right away. But since then, by the way, we were laughed at by a lot of people who were there, the Harvard types. Sure. No offense to Harvard, great school, but you know, they, a lot of the A-kids can't really see this. <laughs> but uh, since then, since 2009, Russia has doubled its gold reserves. China has increased its gold reserves by three or four times. No one knows the exact number because they actually lie about their official reserves. We have some pretty good evidence on that. So China is buying thousands of tons of gold. Are they stupid or do they see something we don't? Well, yeah. I've been to China a lot. They're not stupid. So I think they see this collapse coming. They're getting ready with gold. This is their weapon. And they're always looking at the long game, too. Correct. Uh, Russia and China both think that way, don't they, Kevin? Yeah, sure. And they've signed a $400 billion energy deal as well. I mean, there's a lot of cooperation. Yeah. But China can sit back to a certain degree and watch us fight in an economic war with Russia. And this is kind of some of the outcome that you found. And China can win because we and Russia fight it out. Or China can team with Russia and, and defeat us. I mean, th th this isn't improbable. This is, this is quite possible. China wins either way. They've got $4 trillion of reserves, mostly in U.S. dollars. But they've got 4,000 tons of gold and acquiring more all the time. Mm. So if the dollar is stable, which is probably what they want, their reserves are good. But if we inflate the dollar, which we're trying to do, because the central bank has said that, they're going to lose on the dollars, but they're going to make it up on the gold. So they win either way. And you know, Russia, and, and by the way, China can lend to Russia. So Russia's on the ropes. That's true right now. But China can lend billions of dollars, even a trillion or more, to Russia if they need it. So China's kind of acting like the new IMF, at least for their friends. They actually did help hold up the euro. Yeah, everybody predicted the euro was going to completely collapse. It really looked that way for a while. It yeah. did. Yeah. They held up the euro until recently, and, and the euro is now weakening, but that's the European intent. They want to see the euro weaken. But China held up the euro for a while. George Soros even got frustrated because the euro was staying strong. He said, there's a buyer somewhere, and obviously it was China. One of the policies of this network is anytime George Soros is frustrated, we're happy. <laughs> uh, that's just a policy. Glenn implemented it a long time ago. Um, so there's an impossible amount of variables here. You know, this is really, it's, it's very difficult to predict. So we're not going to, you know, we're not going to take away your firstborn if, if you get this wrong. But what's the, who's the first to act here? I, it feels like if, if, if oil prices stay down here and this sort of continues, 
there's going to have to be, someone's going to take an erratic action at some point. Is it Iran? Is it Russia? Who, what happens? Well, the problem is this isn't team A versus team B. This is five or six or seven very yeah. powerful countries, all with multiple interests acting against each other. So it's the old, you know, three-dimensional chessboard. But mm. the United States uh, did launch financial sanctions against Russia. Now, Russia invaded Crimea. They've got, it uh, looks like they're peeling off eastern Ukraine. We didn't want to put boots in the ground in Crimea. We certainly shouldn't, uh, in my view, but mm -hmm. we did respond with financial warfare. But now Russia's in a position to retaliate. You know, August 22nd, 2013, the NASDAQ was closed for half a day. We've never been given an explanation as to why that exchange was closed. Mm. Was it a cyber attack by Russia or was it a glitch? Well, if it <coughs> were a glitch, why didn't they tell us? And if it was a cyber attack, there'd be good reason not to tell us because you would panic investors. And this, you know, Stu, you invited us to speculate, but this is not speculation. In 2010, the Department of Homeland Security and the FBI found a Russian attack virus embedded yep. in the NASDAQ operating system. Wow. It was not a criminal gang. They were not stealing account information. This was from military intelligence and it's designed to shut down that exchange. This is already going on. So as if investors don't have enough to worry about, we have to worry about these exchanges being shut down. So it's like the old, uh, during the Cold War, you had mutual assured destruction, you know, we shoot our missiles and wipe them out. Mm -hmm. They shoot their missiles and mm -hmm. wipe us out. Both sides built more missiles so they could shoot back. We called it two scorpions in the bottle. One scorpion stings. It's, the victim's going to die, but it has enough strength to sting back, and they both die. We're now in the world of mutual assured financial destruction. If we ratchet up these sanctions, Russia can shut down the New York Stock Exchange. Or they can manipulate. I mean, algorithms, su such a large percentage of the trading is done high frequency via algorithms. If you could manipulate the algorithms to produce an outcome, you could actually take the, the exchange down on a regular basis and people wouldn't understand or know, they wouldn't know the cause of it, but it would weaken the United States substantially. And then you have to have a response. Do you have a plunge protection type team come in and defend the market and mm -hmm. then it becomes all out warfare and the game, the, the, the arena is the stock exchange. Wow. All right, uh, let's come back and, and talk a little bit about what's next for oil. What do we see for the economy coming in the next year? We're back with that in just a minute.